Sector 13. A uh, Caiaphas Kane adventure by Sandy Mitchell. Narrated by a border prince. Of all the worlds I've visited in my long and discreditable career, I suppose Kefir stands out as one of the most pleasant. In the abstract, at least. We were there to fight a war, don't forget. So there was plenty to keep the mind occupied. But in the main, I look back on my years there through a faint haze of nostalgia. Being an agri-world, the landscape was almost completely rural, so my overriding impression was one of endless plains of lush greenery, cut across by isolated roads, which occasionally intersected at quaint, rustic villages, where nothing much seemed to have changed since the emperor was in short trousers. The climate was pleasant too, the small ice caps trickling clear, fresh water into all three continents from large polar mountain ranges, while the narrow equatorial band was mercifully free of any landmass worth fighting over. There were a few small island chains where tiny inbred communities fished and grew tropical fruit, but they were too insignificant to have attracted any enemy attention and were ignored by our side too after the initial sweeps. All in all, I was pretty pleased with life. My inadvertent heroism on Desolatia a couple of years before had won me a little notoriety among the Imperial Task Force, and I'd been able to capitalise on that quite nicely. Even after all this time, there were still sufficient senior officers and administratum functionaries wanting to shake my hand to keep me comfortably occupied attending receptions and seminars far from the fighting so that I frequently found myself away from my unit for days on end. A deprivation that Colonel Mostro, our commanding officer, bore with commendable fortitude, I have to say. Even while I was at my post, things were hardly onerous. The 12th Valhallen field artillery were parked well behind the lines, as you'd expect, so I had had little occasion to face the enemy directly. Indeed, since we were engaged in a protracted campaign to cleanse the planet of a gene-stealer infestation, there was seldom anything to fire our guns at in any case. The war was a subtle one, for the most part, of counterinsurgency and surgical strikes, with the enemy seldom massing in number sufficient to justify an artillery barrage. The occasional exception to this were renegade units of the local planetary defence force, which would turn out to be riddled with Steeler cultists with depressing regularity, and turn their guns on their guard or local units sent to deal with them until our overwhelming superiority in numbers and firepower had their inevitable effect. Like most agri-worlds, Kefir was sparsely populated by imperial standards. This made our job of cleansing the place both easier and harder than it might have been. Easier in that Cities were few and far between. I think there were no more than a dozen on the entire globe. Which meant that the dense concentrations of population a steel occult needs to really take root and hide in were absent, but harder in that the cult had instead become attenuated, spreading its tentacles widely in small pockets of infestation rather than remaining sufficiently concentrated to root out and destroy in a single strike. The upshot of all this was that we'd been forced into a protracted campaign, cleansing the world province by province, one brood at a time, and we'd already seen three winters come and go since we'd arrived here. Some, of course, found the slow pace of the campaign frustrating, not least my crony and closest friend in the battery, Lieutenant Divas, who, as always, was chafing at the bit, eager to get the matter over with and move on to the next war. We're making progress, I told him uncorking the bottle of well-matured Amasek, which had somehow found its way into my kit bag after the last round of handshaking and finger food I'd been dragged off to. Both the northern continents are completely clean already, but they were only ever lightly infested to begin with, he rejoined. Finding a couple of tea bowls in the clutter on my desk, which Jürgen, my aide, had failed to tidy up before disappearing on some mysterious errand of his own. The majority of the stealers we're always down south of here. You know that. Your point being? I asked, pouring the amber liquid with care. Divas shrugged, looking uncannily like a bored child, getting tired of the current amusement. 
I don't know. We could be here for years yet, if something doesn't change. I suppose we could, I agreed, trying not to sound too pleased at the prospect. That would have suited me fine. My adventures with the Tyranids on Desolatia are striking me as more than enough excitement for one commissarial career. Had I but known, of course, it had just been the prelude to a lifetime of narrow escapes from almost certain death. But back then, I had yet to develop the innate paranoia, which was to serve me so well in my subsequent century of running for cover and shooting back when I couldn't avoid it. The prolonged period of relative quiet had lulled me into a false sense of security, which a few years later would have elicited nothing more than a vague sense of waiting for the other boot to drop. So, as I poured the drinks, I had little inkling of the fact that the turning point of the entire campaign was no more than a few hours away, and that once again I would find myself caught up in the middle of events over which I had not the slightest control. The irony was that I'd had my chance to avoid it, but at the time I thought I was being remarkably prudent in not doing so. You see, Colonel Mostro had never quite shaken the feeling that I'd been less than honest about my supposed heroism on Desolatia, when my attempts to save my own neck had inadvertently stumbled across a swarm of nids, which would otherwise have annihilated us, and my subsequent panicked dash back to our own lines had drawn them neatly into the kill zone of our guns. He'd never said anything directly about it, of course, but after that he made a point of creating subtle opportunities for me to prove my mettle, which generally amounted to nudging me in the general direction of trouble and looking out for any overt signs of reluctance to put myself in harm's way again. Luckily, my side trips away from the battery had limited his opportunities for such amusements, but on a couple of occasions I'd been left with no alternative but to tag along with a forward observer unit, with every outward show of enthusiasm, to undermine my fraudulent reputation. As it turned out, these little expeditions hadn't been nearly as unpleasant as I'd anticipated. On each occasion, we'd taken some fire from the cultists as soon as they realised we were sitting out ahead of our own lines, calling in their positions to the battery. But to my well-disguised relief, the subsequent barrages had taken care of that before they got close or accurate enough to be a real nuisance. To all intents and purposes, they'd remained a distant threat, despite the occasional lasbolt putting a dent in the sandbags protecting us. Indeed, in all of these minor engagements, I had never even seen the enemy close enough to tell whether they were true hybrids or merely their human dupes. All that was about to change, though, when the colonel stuck his head into my office the morning after my chat with Divas. Commissar, he said, nailing me with those ice-blue eyes which always seemed to see a lot further into me than I was comfortable with. Do you have a moment? Of course, I responded, with every sign of politeness, ignoring the faint throbbing of Amasek hangover I'd brought into the room with me that morning. Can I offer you some tea? Thank you, no. He moved aside hastily as Jürgen began to pour an extra bowl. I'd known he'd refuse, of course, which is why I'd offered. My aide was a splendid fellow in many respects, not the least of which was the singular lack of imagination that he compensated for with a deference to authority and a literally-minded approach to following orders which simplified my own life in many ways. But he was hardly the most pre-proposing trooper in the guard, and apart from his habitual untidiness, his spectacular body odour meant that visitors were loath to linger in his general vicinity, certainly not for as long as it would take to drink a bowl of tanner leaf tea, uh, one of the few Valhallen habits I've picked up from my prolonged association with the natives of that ice-bound world, by the way. It's made from a plant that's grown in the caverns there, and it has a faintly bitter aftertaste I find most refreshing. As you wish. I sipped at the fragrant liquid, raised an eyebrow in polite inquiry. How can I help you? There's a briefing about the deployment of the garrison troops this afternoon at Brigade Headquarters, Mostru said, clearly fighting the impulse to back away from Jürgen. Unlike the ice worlders I served with, I had my office and quarters open to the sweet spring breezes, 
instead of air-conditioned to the temperature of a meat locker, and it clearly found the relative warmth mildly uncomfortable, not least because it let my aide's distinctive bouquet flourish. Another good reason for leaving the windows open, of course. I thought you might like to attend. And get palmed off on some risky reconnaissance mission to the battlefront as soon as we were there, no doubt. But I couldn't simply refuse. Inviting me to observe the peacekeeping arrangements for the newly cleansed continents on behalf of the Commissariat was a courtesy, at least on the surface. So I thought I'd better just accept, go along and hope I could find some excuse to hang back when the danger presented itself. I was just opening my mouth to agree, inwardly cursing the colonel, when Jürgen unexpectedly came to my rescue. Begging your pardon, sir, but if you're going to be leaving the battery, you'd better reply to the Arbites first. The Arbites? Mastro's eyebrow rose, in slightly exaggerated surprise. Have you been up to something I should be concerned about? Quite a bit, as it happened, but I wasn't about to tell him that. Instead, I picked up the data slate with the flashing red urgent icon Jürgen had placed on my desk, and which I hadn't been able to face looking at through the hangover until the tanner tea kicked in, and glanced at it briefly. Not this time. I smiled too, so we could both pretend it was a joke, and nodded to Jürgen. Thank you for reminding me. I turned back to the colonel. A few of our gunners are in civilian custody. It seems they got a little over-exuberant in one of the local hostelries last night. I sighed. We've carefully feigned regret. So pleasant, as this little trip of yours sounds. I suppose I'll have to stay here and sort things out. Of course. He nodded soberly. Always a sucker for the duty-first routine, and for once, I didn't have to stretch it. Discipline in the battery was definitely my responsibility. So I had the perfect excuse for sidestepping whatever little inconvenience he'd be planning to drop on me. Of course, if I'd known what sorting out that apparently trivial little piece of paperwork would lead to, I'd have gone with him like a shot and taken my chances. But then I'd never have cemented my reputation as a bona fide hero, and the war on Kafia would have taken another turn entirely. The nearest village to our artillery park, uh, Pagus Parva, was about twenty minutes away, or ten the way Jürgen drove, so I had little time to enjoy the fresh spring air as it wafted in across the kilometres of open fields that lined the road. I had become quite familiar with the place in the past few months, so I was already well aware that it was somewhat larger than its name implied. It was the bureaucratic centre of the region, Sector 13, on the maps of the continent we'd been supplied with, by the local administratum, so boasted a handful of civic buildings, as solid and imposing as the temples and libraries of far larger settlements. In peacetime, it had been home to some 2,000 souls rather than the handful of hundreds in the surrounding villages, most of them engaged in supporting the scattered farmsteads, which clustered around it in some way. But the upheaval of the war and the arrival of so many guardsmen in the area, with pay packets in need of emptying, it almost doubled the population. It goes without saying that most of the new arrivals were supporting the war effort by maintaining morale among the troops, in ways which didn't entirely meet the approval of the long-term residents, or for that matter, the local Arbites, which had tripled its manpower over the last few months. That had sounded pretty impressive, until I'd realised all it meant was that the sector sergeant had been joined by a couple of resentful beat-pounders from the provincial capital, who had clearly been selected on the basis of whoever the authorities there had felt the city was most able to manage perfectly well without. The sergeant herself was another matter entirely, as I knew quite well, having taken care to establish good relations with the local Arbites as soon as we were deployed in the region, and to my pleasant surprise, this had developed into rather more than a simple working relationship. Winnetha Fu was a solid career officer in her mid-thirties, about a decade older than I was at the time, with a full figure, which looked quite good in uniform, and even better out of it, as I discovered on a couple of occasions. She was good at her job, knew most of the locals by sight, if not by name and reputation, and had turned down the chance of promotion to more challenging duties in the city at least three times that I knew of, and because she enjoyed the sense of being part of a close-knit rural community. Despite our friendship, she eyed me coolly as I entered the Arbites post from which she 
exercised her stewardship of the scattered hamlets and villages of Sector 13. You took your time, she said. I shrugged, smiling cordially for the benefit of her subordinates, who were slouching around the place, trying to look busy, and advanced through the colonnaded entrance hall of the Sector House towards the high wooden counter, which barred the public from the working part of the building. I know, my apologies. I adopted an expression of resigned good humour. They keep us pretty busy in the guard, you know. I can imagine. If the ones we've got downstairs are anything to go by. She prodded the rune, which retracted part of the counter, having recognised her thumbprint, and recoiled slightly as Jürgen followed me through the gap. The nearest constable's jaw dropped visibly as the gap closed behind us with a faint squeak of unoiled runners. Who's this? My aide, Gunnar Jürgen. I performed the traditional back-and-forth hand gesture, which has accompanied informal introductions since time immemorial. Jürgen, Sergeant Fu of the Arbites. Pleased to meet you, miss. He threw her a slobby salute, which wasn't strictly necessary, what with her being an arbitrator and all, but to Jürgen, a sergeant was a sergeant, and that was that. Besides, she appreciated the courtesy and reciprocated with a nod. Likewise. The pleasantry was reflexive, but Jürgen smiled broadly anyway, uh, curdling the expression of the constable even more, if that were possible. Winithia appeared to notice him for the first time. The rabba, go and collect the commissar's men and sort out the charge sheets. Ma'am? He acknowledged her order with a manifest lack of enthusiasm that would have got any trooper in the guard a stiff talking to, at the very least, and slouched off in the direction of the cells. You better go with him, I told Jürgen. Make sure they behave themselves. Sir, he trotted off behind the constable, who seemed to move a little faster as his new companion approached, leaving me alone with Winitha. I'd been hoping for a little friendly conversation, even a mild flirtation or two, but her mind was entirely on business that morning, and I had to make do with a smile and the offer of a mug of recaf. Let me guess, I said, as I scanned the data slates and let them read my thumbprint to confirm that I'd taken charge of the recidivists in the name of the commissariat. Drunk and disorderly, lewd conduct and a couple of brawls. When Ether's mouth quirked with what looked like genuine amusement. You obviously know your men well, she said dryly. She sipped her mug of recaf. I know these ones a bit too well, I said, scanning the five names which, between them, made up a good ten percent of my workload. That might not sound much to you, but in a battery of over 300 guardsmen, it was a pretty impressive achievement in its own way. Hawken, Nordstrom, Milson, Yavik, and I raised my head to stare disapprovingly at the leading trooper as the small knot of men emerged sheepishly from the cells, and the inevitable gunner, Earlson. He grinned at me with the abashed expression I'd become all too familiar with over the last couple of years. Tell me, Earlson. Are you planning to make Latrine orderly a full-time career? He shrugged. We serve the Emperor as our talents direct, he quoted, eliciting a handful of sniggers from among his compatriots. Where you're concerned, he delegates to me, I reposted. The arbitrators looked a little surprised at the informality of the exchange, but I felt no obligation to enlighten them. Nelson had saved my life back on Desolatia, picking off a tyrannic gargoyle which was swooping on me from behind, and was under the fond illusion that I cut him a little more slack as a result. In actual fact, he was completely mistaken about this, but I did nothing to disabuse him or anyone else of the notion, of being keenly aware that if the rest of the troopers believed that looking out for the commissar's welfare would rebound to their own advantage, I stood a much better chance of enjoying a long and successful career. I swept an evaluating eye over the little knot of troopers. All right. Nordstrom? Who started it? Of all of them, Nordstrom was visibly by far the worst for wear. The others might have been hung over still, but were at least able to function. Yavik and Hoshin had to hold him up between them, and he seemed to focus on the sound of my voice with a visible effort. I'm not sure, sir. He managed to slur it after a moment. Start what? Milson and Elson exchanged glances and sniggered. If anyone had more clearly been in a brawl, I had yet to meet them. Nordstrom's knuckles were bruised and bloodied, his face showing visible contusions, 
and, as his torn, unfastened shirt swung open, I caught sight of a dressing patch at the bottom of his ribcage. Is that a knife wound? I asked, unable to keep a sudden flare of concern from my voice. If it was, the ensuing paperwork would take up the rest of the day. But Winithia shook her head. No, it's superficial. He was hardly even bleeding when we found him. And where was that? I asked. She shrugged. An alley off Harvest Street. No surprise there. It was in the middle of the area. Most of the newer residents plied their trade. In a couple of square blocks of taverns, gambling dens and bordellos, which had sprung up like mushrooms in the shadow of the Agricultural Records Office, to the great discomfiture of the administratum adepts who worked there. At least, so they said. It was those Grock's fondlers in the crescent moon, Yavik said. I bet you. The others nodded, muttering dangerously. They put something in your drink and rob you blind when you keel over. That sounded like nothing more than barrack room gossip to me, but Milson was nodding eagerly in agreement. It's true. They did the same thing to me a couple of weeks back. I glanced at Juanita, who shrugged. Wouldn't surprise me if he did get rolled, she said. We're always scraping drunken guardsmen off the streets around there, and they've usually been picked clean by the time we get to them. I wasn't drunk, Milson asserted vehemently. Well, not very, not that much, anyway. I know how to hold my ale. That much, at least, I knew to be true. Most of the entries in the voluminous file I had on him were for minor infractions involving civic property and small items he'd found lying around somewhere, rather than excessive intoxication. I returned my attention to Nordstrom. Nordstrom? I said slowly, trying to get him to concentrate. What's the last thing you remember? His brow furrowed. Got in a fight. That much was obvious, and judging by the condition he was in, I'd be surprised if he remembered any of the details. But when Ethia pounced on the opening, who with? Once again, Nordstrom's face contorted with the effort of thinking. Dunno, he said at last. Did I win? How about before that? I suggested. This all seemed like a waste of time to me, but I supposed when Ether had to at least make an effort to investigate what went on a few hundred metres from her sector house. And the longer I lingered, the more I could appreciate her company, and the more time there was for Mostru to leave for brigade headquarters, without dragging me along to whatever little surprise he had planned. There was a girl, wasn't there? Milson interrupted. With purple hair? I glared at him to try and shut him up, but Nordstrom was nodding. The ghost of a smile appeared on his face. Camilla. For a moment, a similar dreamy expression descended on Milson too. Amazing tattoos. I knew it. Milson looked triumphant. The last thing I remember before coming round in the alley is buying her a drink. Ring any bells? I asked, Winitha, who was also nodding but with purposeful recognition. Sounds like one of the local joy girls. Works out of the crescent moon. There, that proves it, Yarvik said. He glanced meaningfully at his friends. Someone should go round there and sort them out. It was pretty clear from the tone of his voice who he had in mind for the job. I had no objection to that in principle, having found other establishments more congenial for my own recreational purposes. But this was edging into the realm of things I didn't want to know about because they'd make my job more complicated if I did. So I cut in quickly before they said anything which sounded like a positive plan of action. After all, if I didn't know about any potential trouble, I could hardly be expected to head it off, could I? I think we can safely leave that in the hands of the arbitrators, I said with all the authority I could muster. To his credit, Yarvik took the hint and shut up. Although I would have laid a small wager that the next time I came to town, I'd find the Crescent Moon's windows boarded up at the very least. Worth shaking the tree, I suppose, when Ether said, to my vague surprise. She looked at the constable she'd addressed before. The rabbi, keep an eye on things while I'm gone. She gestured to her other colleague, whose name I never caught with a brusque jerk of her head. You're with me. After a pace or two, she paused and smiled at me. A commissar. It was one of your men who made the complaint, after all. I was a little taken aback, I don't mind admitting, and had I realised what I was letting myself in for, I would have loaded my collection of defaulters 
I pulled the truck outside and headed back to the battery as fast as I could, and taking my chances with Mostro. But it seemed like a harmless enough way of wasting a couple of hours on a pleasant spring morning, and there was always the possibility of a little time alone with Winitha, so I found myself nodding in agreement. Good idea, Sergeant. It'll save us having to bounce reports and data files off each other for the rest of the week. I glanced disapprovingly at the little group of dishevelled gunners and give Nordstrom a chance to pull himself together before we leave. I could see from the covert glances that the troopers exchanged I'd done the right thing there, reinforcing my carefully constructed facade of being firm but fair. Then I strolled out of the building to join Winitha, savouring the sweet spring sunshine for the last time that day. The Crescent Moon was a seedy-looking establishment at the best of times, which was after dark with the flare of pink and blue luminators flashing to lure the undiscriminating customer inside. In daylight, it looked even worse. The peeling paint on the shutters and crumbling plascrete of the facade was a foretaste of the cheap wooden furnishings and even cheaper liquor on sale inside. There were some suspicious-looking stains on the pavement next to the waste bins that I took pains to give a wide berth to as Juanita hammered on the door with the butt of her las pistol. Ah, bites, open up, she yelled, with surprising volume for a woman so small. After a few seconds of nothing happening, she repeated the procedure, attracting the attention of a small gaggle of passing administratum drones that glanced at us furtively and started muttering to each other that it was about time somebody did something about that dreadful place. The door remained resolutely shut. Oh dear, there doesn't seem to be anyone in, Winitha said loudly, sarcasm dripping from every syllable. She turned to the constable, who had drawn his own sidearm, with an anticipatory glint in his eye. We'll have to blow the hinges off. Someone had evidently been listening, because there was a sudden rattling of bolts, and the door creaked open slightly to reveal an unhealthy-looking individual in badly fitting clothes and a barman's apron, which might originally have been some kind of colour under its patchwork of stains. Oh, wait, my mistake. Yes, the man said, his hunched posture making his ingratiating tones and even more insincere than it undoubtedly was. How can I help you, officers? His voice trailed off uncertainly as he caught sight of me for the first time. Whatever he'd been expecting, an Imperial Guard commissar certainly wasn't it. And commissar? Caiaphas Kane, I introduced myself, hoping that something of my reputation had preceded me. A pretty safe bet, given the number of guardsmen among the clientele. A slight widening of his eyes suggested that he had indeed done so. But before I could capitalise on it, Winthia took charge again. Camilla de Pralvsky, we want a quiet word. Winthia pushed past him without ceremony. She works here, right? Yes, she does. The barman scuttled after us, agitation oozing from every pore. But the management is in no way responsible for any actions by members of staff which contravene. Shut it. The new voice confused me for a moment, until I realised the constable had spoken. Until then, I had vaguely assumed he was mute. Just tell us where she is. Upstairs. The barman's eyes were fixed on the las pistols in the hands of the two arbitrators, I glanced around, finding nothing that looked like a threat. The establishment was as shabby as I'd anticipated, looking more like a downhive drinking den than something you'd expect to find on an agri-world. But I guess their customers weren't paying for sophisticated decor. Thank you. Your cooperation has been noted, Winthia said dryly. We left the barman goggling after us and headed for the door in the back of the room with a crudely lettered sign stapled to it saying, Staff only. Behind it, a corridor led to the back of the building, presumably to the storage area and, judging by the smell, either a kitchen or a waste dump. In a place like that, it was hard to tell the difference, along with a rickety flight of stairs which ascended sharply to the left. That must be it, I said. Winitha agreed, and led the way up the stairs, which ran into a corridor running the length of the building, lined with simple wooden doors. The three of us looked at each other and shrugged. One at a time, I suggested. No need. Winitha jerked her thumb at the door to a nearby room a few metres along from us. It had a small ceramic plate adhering to it, with a picture of a fat pink pony in a ballet dress, and 
a Kamala's room, written underneath in wobbly letters that were presumably supposed to look like they'd been done in crayon. This must be it. Before I could say anything humorous about her powers of deduction, she turned suddenly and kicked the thin wooden panel from its hinges. A feminine shriek of surprise an outrage confirmed that we found our quarry, and the constable and I followed the sergeant quickly through the wreckage of the door. Camilla Dubrowski? she asked. Although the question was only a formality, the girl sitting up in the rumpled bed matched Milson's description perfectly. Purple hair tumbling around a narrow face twisted with shock and anger. Get some clothes on. You're coming with us. What for? She began to comply with ill grace, revealing a body entwined with tattoos of a strange but compelling design, just as Nordstrom had said. Despite myself, I couldn't resist studying them, taking in how they accentuated the curves of her body. And as I did so, I felt the palms of my hands began to tingle, always a reliable warning from my subconscious that something isn't quite right. She looked up and glared at me. Enjoying the view, Caiaphas. I didn't know you'd met, Winitha said, switching her attention to me, her tone the temperature of a Valhallen midwinter morning. I haven't, I said. The faint narrowing of the joy girl's eyes as I spoke was enough to tell me that she realised the slip of the tongue had just given her away. And now that the subconscious hint I'd noticed before was hammering against my forebrain, it was obvious there was something not quite right about her musculature, which the Tattoos were designed to obscure. But I did tell the barman my name. I began to draw my chainsword. And stealers communicate telepa- With an inhuman screech, Camilla sprang from the bed, faster than I would have believed possible, barging into the constable who was still blocking the doorway. He tried to bring up his sidearm but was too slow. Camilla's jaw elongated somehow, revealing a mouthful of razor-sharp fangs which clamped down on his throat, shearing through flesh and cartilage and decorating the shabby room with a bright spray of crimson. Emperor on Earth! Winitha snapped off a shot. The lasbolt punched a hole through the shoddy partition wall next to its head, as the shrieking hybrid turned from the spasming body of the constable back towards us. Beyond it, I could hear feet in the corridor outside. Even though I couldn't see the owners, the sound had a, a peculiar scuttling quality which raised the hairs on the back of my neck. The chainsword cleared the scabbard, and I swung it desperately as Camilla leapt again. It's a whole nest of them! I parried a strike from a hand, tipped with talon-like fingernails, feeling the blade bite through chitinous skin, and ducked as those murderous jaws snapped closed, their hands span from my face. Winitha fired again, and for a moment I thought she'd missed, until I realised she was holding off the rest of the brood. Clearly I'd have to finish this one on my own. I swept the humming blade back in a counter-strike, taking the hybrid in the thorax and severing the spinal column. Foul-smelling ichor gushed, reminding me uncomfortably for a moment of the gaunts I'd faced on Desolatia, and the thing that had called itself Kamala dropped at my feet. We're boxed in, Winitha yelled. It certainly looked that way. The narrow cubicle was windowless, the only doorway crowded with horribly distorted parodies of humanity, howling for our blood. She was placing her shots with care, picking off any foolish enough to show themselves directly with las bolts to the head or chest, and pumping rounds through the thin wall from time to time to keep them from rushing the narrow space. I glanced around, a desperate plan beginning to form in my mind. Keep them off for as long as you can, I yelled, swinging the humming blade at the thin wooden wall separating us from the adjoining cubicle. It bit hungrily, whining loudly as wood chips sprayed the room and in seconds I'd carved a hole large enough to accommodate us. I jumped through, holding my humming weapon up ready to block an attack from the other side of the wall as I emerged. But the room beyond turned out to be unoccupied. The golden throne be praised. Bright morning sunshine illuminated a shabby bedroom, almost identical to the one we'd just left, through a window, so grudging it might almost have been opaque. Nevertheless, it was the work of a moment to smash the glass with the pommel of the chainsword and dive through heedless of the drop beyond, while Manithia sent a fusillade of parting shots through the gap behind us to delay our pursuers. I hit the pavement hard, heedless of the jolt that drove the breath from my lungs, relaxing to absorb the impact with the instinct hammered into me by years on the assault courses of the Scholar Progenium, and turned, drawing my own las pistol. A moment later, Manithia hit the ground beside me, and I peppered the window above us with a vindictive enthusiasm blowing the head of a thick-set male from his shoulders. 
As he fell, I noticed a third arm growing from his right shoulder, tipped with razor-sharp talons. How many of these freaks are there? I asked rhetorically. As the barman who let us in emerged from the door and levelled a stubber at us, Winifer took him down, with a snapshot to the gut before he could fire, and we looked at one another with grim understanding sparking between us. More than we can handle. More of the grotesques were emerging from the shadows of the alleyways, moving with a coordinated purpose that was all the more unnerving for taking place in complete silence. With a chill which raised the hairs on my neck, I realised that there were normal-looking humans among them too, carriers of the gene-stealer taint, doomed to birth more of these monstrous hybrids, and with their wills already warped by the telepathic influence of the brood. I recognised one of the administratum drones who'd passed us earlier, a piece of piping in his hands, advancing on us with murder in his eyes, a chilling contrast to the prissy bureaucrat of a few moments before. Pull back, I suggested, uh, suiting the action to the word and sprinting in the direction of the sector house, drawn to the promise of protection beneath the spreading wings of the aquila on the facade, like a penitent to the confessional. Not that I've ever been anywhere near one since the scholar kicked me out, and I hardly ever told the truth in one while I was there. But you know what I mean. Winthia was with me, stride for stride, then our last pistols cracked in unison striking down cultists who were angling across the mouth of the street to cut us off. She activated her personal vox as we ran. Larabba! Break out the weapons! We're coming in hot! All I could hear of the reply was the faint echo of static that told me her earpiece was activated, but her expression was enough to keep me appraised of the other end of the conversation. We've uncovered a steel occult, informed the division office and the local guard units. Her voice caught for a moment. No, he's dead. Just me and the commissar. I missed the next exchange because I was busy ducking a frenzied rush from a hybrid wielding a length of chain. I blocked it with the chainsword, slicing it through, and reposted with a desperate swing that took his head off. A good thing, too. It was remarkably ugly, with far too much tongue. When I regained my balance, she was looking at me. Are your men reliable? That was debatable, really, but under the circumstances, I'd expect them to act like the soldiers they were, so I just nodded. Winthia activated her vox again. Arm the troopers! A pause. I don't care how hungover they are. Even if all they can do is remember which way to point a gun, they're better than nothing. They'll do a lot better than that, I said, stung at the implied slur on the men I served with. True, they were rear echelon warriors rather than frontline fighting troops. Give them an earthshaker or two and they'd flatten a city block neat as you please. But small arms weren't really their speciality. On the other hand, they practised assiduously on the shooting range. Mostro saw to that, as he did every other regulation. And Olsen, at least, was a pretty fair marksman, as I could attest from the mere fact that I was still breathing. And don't forget, they'd fought off the Nids on Desolatia. So, even if they weren't exactly battle-hardened veterans, they'd already proved they could fight up close and personal if they needed to. So all in all, I felt pretty confident in their abilities. I hope so. Winthia took down the last of the cultists between us and the sector house, and we started across the open square towards it. Our boot soles rang on the flagstones, echoes rising from the facades of the encircling administratum blocks, and small chips of stone began to kick up around us, preceded by the distinctive crack of ionised air which accompanies a las weapon discharge and the deeper bark of a stubber or two. Despite myself, I turned to look behind us, Losing off a couple of shots myself in the vague hope of keeping our assailants' heads down, then redoubled my efforts to reach the sector house. My worst fears had been realised. The cultists had been joined by a handful of men in the uniform of the local PDF, who were armed with standard-issue las guns, and several of the hybrids had produced personal firearms of one kind or another. There were more of them than I could have dreamed possible. Dozens of twisted monstrosities, crowding into the square from all directions, converging on us with a grim fixity of purpose that clenched my bowels. PDF! Renegade! I gasped, feeling the air begin to rasp in my lungs. I couldn't keep this pace up for much longer, but to falter meant being torn apart by the mob of inhuman hybrids behind us. They surged on like a malevolent tide, untiring and implacable, uncannily reminiscent of the tyrannid swarms that had forged their foul purpose and sent them out to infiltrate the Imperium. This is just getting better and better, Winthia smiled grimly, 
and dropped one of our leading pursuers. The others didn't even falter, flowing around it like water round a rock. Another group was just clearing the corner of the sector house, angling in to cut us off from our refuge. The lasbolt, more accurate than the rest, caught the hem of my greatcoat, tugging at it like an importunate child. Aim for the shooters, I cancelled. If we couldn't at least throw their aim off, they'd have us cold in seconds. If they'd been proper guard troopers, we'd have been dead already, of course. And I found myself thanking the Emperor for the habitual sloppiness of the PDF, which, like most professional soldiers, I usually found so irritating, especially while trying to coordinate with them on the battlefield. It went without saying that on the few occasions we'd been forced to cooperate with the local forces, Colonel Mostro had been all too pleased to delegate this onerous task to me, and I'd had no choice but to comply with as much good grace as I could muster. Of all the varied duties of a commissar, I've always found liaising with PDF trolls amongst the most irritating. We turned in unison, aiming as best we could, but under the circumstances I didn't expect much. At the very best, we were only delaying the inevitable until our pursuers closed. But I've always found that when you truly believe you only have seconds left to live, each one becomes so precious, you become determined to eke them out for as long as possible, whatever the cost. We fired as one, expecting little effect, but to my astonishment the renegade troopers were falling, breaking and running for cover. Cowards! I bellowed, carried away with the adrenaline and the reckless bravado of imminent death. Stand and fight like men, damn you! Are you mad? Winthia was staring at me in astonishment, and I whipped my chainsword up into a defensive posture, ready to take on the first wave of hybrids that was already leaping towards us, inhuman jaws agape. Run, you idiot! Only then did I realise that several of our would-be assailants were falling, and bloody craters exploding across their chests, and the distinctive crack of Laz fire was coming from behind us now. Instinct took over once again, and I followed her advance, finding the square behind us littered with the corpses of cultists who had tried to cut us off. This way, Commissar! Uri! Jürgen's familiar voice urged me on, and as I looked up at the sector house, now tantalisingly close, I caught sight of him, crouched behind one of the columns supporting the portico, a lasgun raised and spitting death at the horde of cultists behind us. A moment later, I noticed another muzzle flash, and made out Elson, similarly positioned, picking off one target after another with smooth precision. He caught sight of me and grinned, no doubt enjoying himself hugely. Larrabee was by the door, the blue of his Arbites uniform standing out starkly against the rich, polished wood, blazing away on full auto, without even the pretense of expertise, but the crush of distorted bodies was so great, aiming wasn't strictly necessary. Wherever he pointed his weapon, hybrids and human cultists alike fell like wheat before the harvesters. With Jürgen's encouragement ringing in my ears, I put on a final spurt, vaguely surprised to find that a small part of my mind was still able to appreciate the rear of Winthia bounding up the steps a few metres ahead of me. And then, almost before my senses could register it, I was surrounded by the cool marble foyer of the sector house. I turned back to find Larrabee, closing the doors, while Jürgen and Olsen backed through them, still firing on the frenzied mob, which by now were cresting the steps outside and bounding over their fallen comrades in a single-minded attempt to reach the narrowing gap. They almost made it at that. The door stopped centimetres from closing, blocked by a chitinous arm, tipped by three scythe-like talons, which gouged a deep groove from the thick hardwood as it flailed around for purchase. The two gunners leapt to assist the constable, putting their shoulders to the wood. But even with all three of them straining every muscle, the sheer weight of the tide of bodies behind it began to force the doors open again. I slashed down with the humming chainsword, severing the obscene limb that dropped to the floor, thrashing and leaking foul-smelling ichor, and the door slammed too. Larabai triggered the locking mechanism, and the thick steel bolt slammed home, securing it behind us. What the hell did you think you were playing at out there? Winthia was glaring at me, a complex mixture of emotions on her face. Were you trying to get yourself killed? There was no point in admitting I'd been so far gone, I hadn't even noticed our comrades just opened up a corridor to safety for us. So I just shrugged. Well, you know, I said, ladies first. The effect was quite gratifying, I have to say. She hugged me briefly, failing to find any words, and turned away, already assessing our situation like the professional she was. Erlson and Larrabee were looking at me with undisguised admiration, and I was suddenly sure, correctly as it turned out, 
that suitably embroidered reports of my gallantry and heroism would be all over the sector before the week was over. I turned to Jürgen, who was taking in the scene outside with his usual phlegmatic manner. What's our situation? I asked. Frat, Olsen muttered, before turning back to the nearest window and beginning to amuse himself by taking pot shots at the abominations outside. Fortunately, the Arbites tend to the sort of caution I was later to acquire and the place was constructed to withstand a siege quite comfortably. The windows were narrowed and placed to provide excellent firing positions. Pretty defensible, Jürgen said, ignoring him. We could do a couple of full squads to cover everything, though. We're spread pretty thin. Might as well wish for a chapter of Astartes while you're at it, I said. But as usual, my aide was immune to sarcasm, and he just nodded. That would be nice, he agreed. Where are the others? I asked. Jürgen gestured towards the rear of the building. Milson's covering the back door. He found some grenades in the armory and he's booby-trapping the entrance. Horshin's with him. Yavik's up on the roof. What about Nordstrom? I asked. Still sleeping it off? I don't know. Jürgen looked confused for a moment. I thought he was with us. A building this size? He could be anywhere, I said. Before we could speculate further, the sound of last fire cut across the silence. Drawing the obvious conclusion, I glanced across at Elson but he was in the middle of reloading and looked as puzzled as the rest of us. They came from inside! Wimpia led the rush back towards the rear of the building. The firing intensified for a moment, then ended with a gurgling scream that raised the hairs on the back of my neck. Too impatient to wait for the counter to retract, I vaulted over it, landing heavily, and found myself facing the door to the rear of the building, through which Jürgen and Larabai had disappeared to fetch the others what seemed like a lifetime ago but which my chronometer stubbornly insisted had been little more than an hour. Protect the brood! Nordstrom appeared through the gap, a bloodstained combat knife gripped in his hand, his eyes as vacant as those of the infected humans outside. The full significance of the apparently trivial wound on his chest suddenly became clear to me. I sidestepped his swing, blocking reflexively with the chainsword, and took his hand off at the wrist. To my amazement, he didn't even slow down spinning to strike at my eyes with the extended fingers of his other hand. I ducked my head just in time, feeling the impact against my skull, barely cushioned by my cap, and heard his fingers break an instant before the crack of a las pistol next to my ear told me that Winthia was still watching my back. As he fell, she ran past him, sprinting for the end of the corridor. A las bolt took her in the shoulder, spinning her back into my arms. I glanced at the wound, noting in passing that it was already cauterized, so at least she wouldn't bleed to death, before handing her back to Larabai. Milson was at the far end of the corridor, his lasgun aimed at us, a dozen or so frag grenades crudely wired to the thick wooden door behind him. A faint scrabbling sound betrayed the presence of our assailants beyond it, still determined to break through. Horshin's body was lying between us in a pool of blood, clearly beyond any medical aid. Cease fire, you idiot, I yelled. It's us. Ah, oh, no. The emotionless timbre of his voice warned me what he was about to do even before my conscious mind registered the blankness of his stare. Back! I yelled to the others, even as he detonated the explosives, blowing the thick wooden door to splinters and himself to perdition. A shrieking tide of malformed malevolence burst through the gap, jaws gaping, talons extended to rend and tear. A volley of lads fire from all of us blasted into the first rank, but those behind just kept coming, barely slowed by the obstruction of their fallen fellows. Fire and movement! It was a desperate gamble, but one we just made, taking in turns to shoot down the front rank of hybrids while the rest of our party retreated to the stairwell leading to the roof. Even Winthia managed to keep firing, her face pale with shock, as Larabai helped her up the staircase to safety. It was a close-run thing, mind, and we'd never have got away with it if the corridor hadn't been so narrow. Even now... I break out in cold sweats at the thought of how things would have gone if the monsters had been able to close a little faster, or our fire had been a little more attenuated. Up here, Commissar! I grabbed the preferred hand gratefully. Elson, hauling me, clear of the stairwell just as Javik lobbed a couple of grenades down among the seething mass of chitin, and Jürgen slammed the heavy steel fire door closed. The dull thud of the explosion shook the metal as I leaned against it, and Larabai locked it closed. I gasped the fresh air of the outside hitting my lungs like pure oxygen, leaving me momentarily giddy from the reaction. They seem pretty steamed, Yavik said, 
Glancing over the side of the roof and taking a random potshot into the crowd for luck, I followed his gaze, and the breath seemed to freeze in my throat. We were surrounded now by what seemed to be hundreds of the monstrosities, lapping around our flimsy refuge like the incoming tide around a sandcastle. In that moment, I knew we were doomed, that all we could hope to do was stave off the inevitable. Look, sir. Jürgen was pointing at something, a grin of imbecilic delight on his face, and for a moment I thought he'd gone mad under the strain. Then I saw it too, the unmistakable silhouette of an imperial chimera, and behind it, it's the Cadians. Sure enough, the column of armoured vehicles bore the crest of the Cadian 101st, an elite assault regiment that had just arrived in the sector from the victorious campaign in the north. Hard luck for them to be thrown straight back into the fighting, I thought at the time, but as it turned out, it was just as well they were the closest guard unit and the first to respond to the message Winthia had ordered Larabai to send. The unmistakable rattle of heavy bolters burst across the square like thunder, scything the milling abominations down where they stood. We joined in enthusiastically from our perch on the roof, pouring down fire from above, watching in undisguised relief as the tide of obscenity broke in disorder. The thudding and scrabbling against the metal door died away as the brood realised it was facing a far greater threat than us and turned to meet it. Well done, Kai. Divas looked at the gleaming new medal on my coat with barely suppressed envy. As usual, he was the only one present to use the familiar form of my given name, and from the corner of my eye I noticed Wenthia, her dress uniform augmented by a sling which made her look fascinatingly Amazonian, grin as she picked up on my thinly disguised irritation. Looks like you got all the fun again. It wasn't the same without you, I assured him, straight-faced. I glanced across at Erlson, who was looking surprisingly subdued considering he was supposed to be another of the guests of honour. I expected you to be a bit happier under the circumstances, Erlson. Free drink, all the food you can eat. I know, it's these. He fingered the freshly sewn bombardier stripes on his sleeve moodily. They're kind of inhibiting. Don't worry, I assured him. Knowing you, I doubt you'll keep them for long. Well, there is that, he said, looking markably more cheerful and wandering off to investigate the buffet. What the six of you did, Divas persisted. If you hadn't found the cult, they would have infected every guard unit on the continent eventually, and we'd have lost the war. It doesn't bear thinking about. Then don't, I said. I was still getting reports in from the purges going on in practically every regiment on the planet. Dozens of men executed for the taint they carried, without even having been aware of the fact, and it left a sour taste in my mouth. I turned to Wenthia, desperate for a distraction. Care to dance? To begin with, she agreed. So, I'm back for my baby, dr <laughs> my baby break. I'm terrible at recording. If this isn't up to my usual standard, it's because it took me about a week to gather up the courage to start doing this again. I haven't touched my computer in like 10 weeks since November, like the middle of November. Oh, great, I'm knocking things over now. So yeah, I've had to work myself up for this and get back into the stride of things. But content will resume. I've got a new video planned I'm working on now. And uh, I hope you do enjoy this. Now this, it's got to be the first or maybe this, I haven't looked it up. But this is definitely the first Caiaphas Kane story I ever read. I remember. And I always remember his things. I, I thought to myself, he's a Lothario. He's got a sardonic sense of humour. He's, uh, he's uh, rightfully paranoid. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, he, and he preserves his own skin. And I fell in love with the character. And like, Sandy Mitchell really locked down this character in, in these initial sort of short stories. And, and it's been just a, a joy ever since, really, to go through them. Because you know the character, you know who he is. And he's kind of, he reminds you of yourself, how you would like to think that you'd think in these situations. And uh, within the, and it's funny within the framework of 40k, you know, it's like, it's not like fourth wall breaking. Even when you get um, Amberly Vale editing the stuff in the, in the novels later on, every, all, the, all the comedy, all the funniness is within the context of 40k, which is the thing I always long for. I hate these things where they're, you start to see it in some of the novels now, which is a bit frustrating, people sort of projecting sort of like... The, the the morality of our world onto things. It's frustrating. It shouldn't be happening. This is 40k, yeah? 
Anyway, this is perfect. Kyphus Kane is perfect. And if you ever want to get into 40K, I recommend these novels um, particularly. That You might want to read some of the more, I don't want to say serious, but you know what I mean, more, some of the more normal mainstream 40K stuff. And then you get these and they're like a breath of fresh air. You know, it's a different view on the Imperium and how things go. Kyphus Kane is a loyal servant of the throne, but he's not crazy, <laughs> you know. So good stuff all around. Thank you to everybody who's been supporting the channel in my, during my hiatus. For those who don't know, I've just had a son. And um, he's great. He's brilliant. He uh, he likes to eat a lot, and um, I've become a adept at uh, changing nappies. But he's great, and I I needed to take that time with my missus to, to to get everything right and make sure everything's fine, you know. And I just couldn't concentrate on this at the time either because it was a it was a hard process, and I won't go into details because you don't need to know. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's all good now, and you know everything's golden. So yeah, thank you for everybody who's been continued to support the channel throughout this hiatus. And uh, I appreciate it. And I appreciate your patience. And to everybody who subscribes anyway, um, really appreciate that. And I hope you do enjoy this video. More stuff is coming. I've got big plans for the channel. More stuff coming, just to name a few things. Blackstone, Krieg, uh, Blood Angel stuff um, with the sort of devastation of Baal and all various different things. And we're probably going to start delving into heresy more and uh, some reviews and things like that. Probably do some live streams, some gaming, so some, some chatting stuff. I don't know. All the different things are coming up. If you'd like to support the channel, bit of, let's, I've got to get the shilling. I've been away for a while. I need to get the shilling. Please do consider becoming a YouTube member or a patron over on Patreon and uh, subscribe star as well if you're interested in that, if you prefer that method. But if you can, that'd be great. I really appreciate it. But if you can't, I understand. But please do like the video and let me know in the comments what you think. That all really helps a smaller channel like mine. Go up against the big boys. Because I deserve it. <laughs> All right. I'll see you all again very, very soon. Again, I appreciate your uh, patience and your continued support. And uh, yeah, more stuff is coming down the pipeline. And uh, apologies if this is a bit ranty. I'm going to end it now. But yeah, it's been a, been a, a big deal in my own life. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it took some time to, to get back to this. And uh, I'm back to it now. I, you know, again, this might not be the, the top quality work that I usually do that you expect from me, but uh, <laughs> I hope it's, uh, it's good enough for now and uh, the next one will be even better. I'm going to go now. Thank you all very much. Have a, a good new year. What's the date? Okay, we're a bit past that, but yeah, have a good new year and uh, stick with me for the rest of the year. More good stuff is coming. You will not be disappointed. Probably not anyway. Who knows? I'm going to go now. Thanks very much again. And um, yeah, please do like the video and all that. Oh, I'm going to go. Bye-bye. Ta-ra. See you later.